John Carpenter's Halloween took the horror world by storm when it released in 1978. It was, in effect, the first true slasher film, but that subgenre shares many similarities with Jalos, the first of which is often accredited to the film The Girl Who Knew Too Much, and of which Carpenter was clearly influenced, though the gore remains far tamer here than in its inspiration. With a budget of just $325,000, the film managed to make $70 million at the box office, and presumably much more since then, safely making it a massive financial success. Halloween spawned a film franchise comprising 13 films, which helped construct an extensive backstory for its antagonist, Michael Myers, sometimes narratively diverging entirely from previous installments. A direct sequel to the film was released in 1981, a unrelated film subtitled Season of the Witch dropped in 1982, before Michael Myers returned from his seeming death in Halloween 4, The Return of Michael Myers in 88. Halloween H20, a soft reboot ignoring the events of all but the first two films, released in 1998, facilitating Jamie Lee Curtis's return to the franchise after 17 years. A remake was released in 2007, led by rock star turned hillbilly director Rob Zombie, an 11th installment which serves as a direct sequel to the original film that retcons all previous sequels was released in 2018. This was followed by two direct sequels, Halloween Kills and Halloween Ends, which supposedly brings the franchise to a close. But let's be real, as long as there's money to be made, this series will never die. How was that, Jordan? Was was that all, was that all right? Oh yeah, yeah, good job. Come on, you're meant to be my stage manager. You you gotta pay more attention. You know, Craig, when I said I wanted to be in more videos, this isn't exactly what I had in mind. Hey, I mean, if you don't want to do it, I can always give Jake the role. Hmm. The now iconic intro slowly zooms in on a pumpkin, which, if you look carefully, actually appears to be Michael Myers holding a knife, while the score, composed by John Carpenter in just three days, sets the tone perfectly for the simple, genre-defining slasher that is to follow. A POV shot follows this young couple through a house on Halloween 1963 in Haddonfield, Illinois. After grabbing a knife, the mysterious figure stalks the woman upstairs after her boyfriend leaves and- Wait, no, no, I can't show this, no! Oh god, no, the YouTube police! After killing his sister, we find out that it was the young boy Michael Myers dressed as a clown. Fifteen years later at a mental institution called Smith's Grove, Dr. Sam Loomis and a nurse arrive to bring Michael in front of a judge to ensure he remains housed there for the rest of his life. You mean you actually never want him to get out? Never. 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 But the Joker wannabe has different ideas and manages to steal their car amid a mass breakout, giving us a fleeting look at an unmasked Michael as he uncharacteristically spares the young nurse's life. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you breaking news. Renowned serial killer Mr. Spookums has broken out of his high security cell in the local high security prison. Mr. Spookums is known for being very spooky. Unfortunately, we have no photos of him because all the cameras were too scared. Local law enforcement has warned to look out for anyone wearing a scary mask. In other news, it's Halloween night and trick or treaters will be everywhere wearing scary outfits. That concludes our breaking news broadcast. I've been John Smith. Thank you and good night. Back in Haddonfield, Jamie Lee Curtis's Laurie Stroh drops by the abandoned Myers house, and unbeknownst to her, is watched by a figure from inside, and on the street. This is such a genuinely creepy moment, and unfortunately when I got to see this in cinemas a few years ago, most of the audience found this moment and many others laugh out loud funny. Michael has upgraded from creepy teen watcher to little kid watcher, what a nonce. Dr. Loomis is in hot pursuit of Myers, while these three babysitters are in pursuit of some hot goss. The only reason she babysits is to have a place Shit. to Shit. 
I have a place for that. Michael stalks the trio with his car. Don't worry, they technically explain how he learned to drive. Five movies later. It involves a cult. The sequels get really stupid. Laurie gets jump scared by the law, which is how we meet Sheriff Brackett, the father of one of her friends. You know, it's Halloween. I guess everyone's entitled to one good scare, huh? <sighs> Laurie heads out to a babysitting job, thoroughly spooked by the man seemingly stalking her. Loomis arrives at Judith Meyer's graveyard, Michael's mother, only to find the headstone missing. He came home. John Carpenter approached Peter Cushing and Sir Christopher Lee to play the role of Dr. Sam Loomis. That was eventually played excellently by the late Donald Pleasance. But both turned him down due to the low pay. Lee later said it was the biggest mistake he had ever made in his career. And while Cushing and Lee would have undoubtedly been great in the role, Pleasance really makes it his own, with the character slowly becoming more and more unhinged as the sequels continued. No! 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 Laurie takes a hit in Annie Brackett's car as they run into her father, and find out a Halloween mask, rope, and knives were stolen from the local hardware store. As they drive off, Loomis meets Brackett, and we get this wonderful shot where Michael watches his old doctor from the background. Now, that is cinema. The girls arrive at their respective babysitting jobs, only for Annie to quickly pawn off her kid on Laurie across the street. Loomis gives the sheriff, and the audience, the rundown on why he wanted to keep Michael locked up. I met this six-year-old child with this blank, pale, emotionless face and the blackest eyes, the devil's eyes. Across town, Tommy Doyle and Laurie are watching 1951's The Thing From Another World, which director John Carpenter went on to direct the remake of in 1982, and which received a further remake slash prequel in 2011. Alright, uh, Jordan, I think it's about time for lunch. I put it down here, right? I'm sure of it. How do you lose a bright orange pumpkin mask? I don't know. Somebody must have took it. Who could have taken it? We're the only ones in the house. Jake. Look, just go grab us some food. We'll figure something out. Annie's washing her clothes when we see Michael looking through the window at her. It's this sort of subtle scare that makes the film work so well. Unfortunately, as she goes to leave in her car, she finds the glass foggy, and quickly ends up getting strangled to death by Michael in what is a slow and painful death to watch. Tommy sees the boogeyman carrying the body into the house, but when lovestruck couple Linda and Bob arrive, they see nothing wrong and quickly get to work. When Bob goes downstairs to find a drink, he instead finds a jump scare. Boo. Bob's death isn't jokey, or particularly showy, like Jason would often make it. It's a single, quiet stab, and then silence, a room completely devoid of life.
Michael wants to get in the Halloween spirit, so does some dress up to mess with Linda. She tries talking to him. Cute, Bob, real cute. But Michael just ghosts her. Before he stra- YouTube police! YouTube police! Loomis finds the stolen car and sets off towards the house. Laurie, sensing something's wrong, heads over to check on Annie and Linda, only to find the bodies of her friends laid out by the killer. I guess I was wrong about that whole not showing off thing. And we get this great shot meant to mimic our eyes adjusting to the darkness so that we can see Michael hiding in the shadows. And with a swipe and a fall, our final girl circuit begins in earnest. Jordan, why are you wearing that stupid sheet? Oh no! Laurie manages to escape the house and run back across the street, where she gets a hit in on the serial killer. But he comes back, leading to the now infamous closet scene, where he gets a pretty nasty stab to the chest. Double tap him, you beautiful fool! Luckily, Dr. Loomis arrives just in time to save the starlet's life by putting six shots into the killer, sending him plummeting down to earth, only to find that Mere seconds later, he's disappeared into the night. And with that, Halloween comes to an end. But how does this horror classic hold up all these years later? Hey, Mr. Spookums. You're a pumpkin. I fucking hate pumpkins. <sighs> that was awesome! And with that, Halloween comes to an end. But how does this horror classic hold up all these years later? Look, this film started a 13 movie long franchise and revolutionized the entire horror genre as we know it. It's great, of course it's great. There's a reason why it's a classic. John Carpenter is one of the all-time directors. Jamie Lee Curtis gives a solid performance, even if it's nothing mind-blowing. The film is scary. Its slow, suspenseful build-up to a couple chilling kills easily cements it as one of the very best. And even all this time later, despite some dated elements, it still holds up incredibly well. Not only the best Halloween movie, but one of the best slashers ever. Where do you think he went? You may never know where he went, or where he came from. Mr. Spookums was a mystery to us all, and maybe, maybe even to himself. Deep down, maybe the real Mr. Spookums was the friends we made along the way. We can ask Jake. Hmm? Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed, and I hope we never again encounter Mr. Spookums. A special shout out to Jake and Jordan for all their help they gave for this video. Uh, I really appreciate it. But until next time, I hope you have a spooky day and an even scarier tomorrow. Happy Halloween.